love you too. I told Sam, don't put me in my grave too soon. I got a lot more work to do. <laughs> As CEO of the King Center, let me officially welcome all of you to our 55th observance of my father's birthday, the 38th federal holiday observance, in honor of what would have been his 94th birthday. To Pastor Senator Warnock, thank you for opening the doors of Ebenezer to us once again on this sacred day. Uh, we are honored to have in person uh, with us today um, one of my aunts and the other is coming, I believe. Um, my 91-year-old aunt, who is my father's brother, A.D.'s King's wife, Mrs. Naomi King. God bless you, Aunt Naomi, and thank God that you're with us. And I believe that my father's sister, who's 95 years old, my aunt, uh, will be joining us uh, a little later, Dr. Christine King Ferris. We thank God. And as we speak, perfect timing. Now, we didn't, we didn't do this, you all. Yes, God bless you, Aunt Christine. Amen. God is good. Look at somebody next to you and say, God is so good. <laughs> So, uh, don't start the clock on me until I do this. <laughs> For a moment, I want to remember the life of two powerful and extraordinary women who were shining lights in their own way as the bearers of the legacy of James Orange. Continuing in the tradition of the foot soldiers, Jemida Orange, who led the MLK March Committee every year since her father's passing in 2008, transitioned from her earthly body suddenly at age 52 on October 16, 2022. And her mother, Mrs. Cleo Orange, who stepped into the leadership role with the March Committee this past October in preparation for this year's March, transitioned from her earthly body as well on January 4th of this year. These are penetrating and significant losses for this family and so many of the others of us so let us pause for a moment of reflection on their life and pray for the family who had to endure the sudden loss of their eldest sister and now their matriarch who will be laid to rest on tomorrow. Amen. For the past 55 years, there have been commemorations in honor of my father's birthday, not only in this nation, but around the world. Many have recited his words. And since the inception of the federal holiday 38 years ago, many have performed numerous acts of service. While I'm beyond honored to be the daughter of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and witness the myriad ways that people who are inspi inspired by him have chosen to celebrate him. I am also exhausted, exasperated, and frankly disappointed that after all these years, we have seen minimal progress around eradicating what he called the triple evils of poverty, racism, and militarism. I'm disappointed that little to nothing has changed in our hearts and minds, in our homes. Yes, and I'm a preacher, I'm a preacher, even in our houses of worship, in our communities, our schools, our politics. 
in our media and entertainment, our NGOs, our nation and world that aligns with the true king. We love to quote king in and around the holiday and even pause to do acts of service. But then we refuse to live king 365 days of the year. We have crafted a comfortable and convenient king so that we do not have to do anything personally to change our thinking and behavior around what he called those triple evils and certainly not transform unjust systems that has caused much hurt, harm, and damage to so many people in our world house. However, we must move beyond the quotable king to the livable king because our world is in moral distress. Yes, it, it feels good to, to quote uh, my father, and uh, we can all quote him because it is convenient, especially when we extract the portions that suits our agenda, cause, campaign, or purpose. The, kit, the convenient king is easy to embrace because it requires no fundamental change on our part. But to live the true and comprehensive king is inconvenient because he was not just spouting some words for our recitation and elucidation. His words carried prophetic mandates. He was God's prophet sent to this nation and even the world to guide us and forewarn us. When a prophet speaks, I want you to hear me, his words are not for our convenience or her words. They make a demand on us and are to our detriment and peril if we ignore them. Prophets speak about choices and consequences. And Dr. King was telling us, if we don't do this, then this will happen. A prophetic word calls for an inconvenience because it challenges us to change our heart, our mind, and our behavior. Too many have brought into the notion that if we just do the work, that's what's important. We think that if we just extract the king that fits our particular situation, we are representing his work and his legacy. But nothing could be further from the truth. We must reflect the spirit and heart of king. To merely work in king's name and not also seek to cultivate a beloved community mindset that he had only will create temporary outcomes and not transform unjust systems. Transformation requires being inconvenienced because you have to adjust some things. You have to give up some things. You have to make room for some things. On this day of commemoration, the prophet king, the inconvenient king, puts a demand on us to change our way of thinking. In fact, what he, when he said, and where do we go from here, chaos community, still holds true. Nothing could be more tragic than for people to live in these revolutionary times and fail to achieve the new attitudes and the new mental outlooks that the new situation demands. He was demanding that we shift our thinking to a beloved community mindset so that we can properly coexist even with our adversaries to avoid being forced to perish together as fools, as he said. We must move beyond the convenient king to the inconvenient king if we're going to save the soul of America and the world and interrupt the self-destructive course that we are currently on. Now, we can't use king for our convenience to tout messages of unity, yet spout divisive rhetoric and work on divisive policies. We can't use king for our convenience to encourage colorblindness and judging people by the content of their character and not do the work of eradicating racism. We can't conveniently use King's philosophy without his methodology. We can't conveniently promote Dr. King's philosophy of nonviolence but pervert it by talking about love without justice and call for peace just to avoid tension and direct action. And conversely, we cannot use direct action that is not love-centered, but is filled with bitterness and rage. 
You cannot and we cannot conveniently use King to call for unity, then turn around and cancel people wishing for and working towards their destruction. I know you can't hear that, but it's true. We can't conveniently celebrate Dr. King on MLK Day, then fight for him to be banned from schools. But, 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 we also cannot conveniently speak up for him to be taught in schools, but don't fully support his complete teachings around poverty, racism, and militarism. No, we can't conveniently use King to merely engage in philanthropic giving and service, then refuse to be inconvenienced by the reordering of our priorities to work assiduously on addressing those policies and edifice that make the service and philanthropy around hunger, homelessness, and the like necessary. We cannot conveniently tweet what we love to do about King and equality on MLK Day and use the same Twitter account to highlight and justify our transportation of human beings like cargo to prove political points around immigration and sanctuary cities. But, 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 at the same time, we can't conveniently say King is a hero for us yet refused to initiate negotiations to create just, humane, equitable, and strategic policies on immigration reform. By the way, Senator Warnock, and this is not directed towards you and all of the other elected officials necessarily in this place today, but if the shoe fits, just wear it. Congress, Congress, and the Senate, because I don't want us to get it twisted, even though we call it all Congress, but I'm saying Congress and the Senate, for those who don't understand that, cannot conveniently extol King's dream, but won't set aside partisan politics to pass policies to end the nightmares around economic disparity and unlivable wages, insecure voting rights, the shattering effects of not having responsible gun laws, out-of-control police brutality, and the climate crisis that is devastating our world house with unprecedented flooding and catastrophic weather patterns. No, 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 no more. We cannot conveniently quote King in response to gun violence in our streets and wars in our world than not use his teachings to interrupt violence in our media, entertainment, policies, language, and culture. Our affinity for convenience is destroying our humanity. We can no longer lo afford the convenience of technology without the inconvenience of moral integrity. Because as the prophet King warned us, we are in danger of destroying ourselves in the misuse of our own instruments. We can no longer afford the convenience of unfettered spending because as the prophet King warned us as a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense rather than programs of social uplift, that nation is approaching spiritual doom. We can no longer afford the convenience of not studying, studying, studying nonviolence, because as the prophet King warns us, we still have a choice today, nonviolent coexistence or violent co-annihilation. And I'm almost at the end now. We are, my brothers and sisters, in a human-made conundrum, but we can come out of this if we choose the inconvenient King. That reminds us that we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. And what affects one directly affects all indirectly. And for some strange reason, I can't be all that I ought be until you are all that you ought be. And you can't be all that you ought be until I, Bernice, am all that I ought be. 
We must begin the rapid shift, as my father said, from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society and must develop an overriding loyalty to all humanity. The inconvenient king, look at your neighbor and say, the inconvenient king, reminds us that although the moral arc of the universe is long, it does still bend towards justice if we keep doing the righteous and just work. And if we choose community over chaos and coexistence over co-annihilation, then our dawn will break forth like the morning. Each of us, and I mean each of us, has a choice today. It starts with me, Bernice Albertine King. But it's about us choosing today to cultivate that beloved community mindset to transform unjust systems. Now that's the inconvenient king.